morning or afternoon, wherever you're at listening to this. In our last session, we took a look at Paul's instructions on how to live in light of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We were instructed to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and give thanks in all circumstances. A lot of good advice. But today we're going to move on uh, and finish off the uh, fifth chapter, but also the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going to travel on in Paul's instruction, uh, verses 19 through 22. And it's kind of some interesting instructions that uh, he gives on. And actually, we will go to the end of the book in this, in this section. So this will be divided, actually, into two small sections. So it says in verse 19, 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. These four very short verses relate the first to the first command of this section, do not quench the Spirit. Paul, as we have seen, taught the new believers of this young church about the Holy Spirit in chapter 1, uh, verses 5 and 6, and chapter 4, verse 8. We see that there was definitely instruction to the uh, people at Thessalonica about the Holy Spirit. Essentially, they had given them a crash course in new mythology, which is... Uh, a college word for the study of the Holy Spirit or doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine, in essence, is this. When Christ went to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, every true believer in Christ was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Ever since then, when a person trusts in Christ as his Savior, the Holy Spirit baptizes him into the body of Christ. In so doing, he makes us a holy sanctuary or a temple of sorts, a temple of God. The role of the Holy Spirit is is there to teach us and guide us and give us direction, to convict us and to show us how to understand the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit is also a source of joy, peace, and love for us to transform our lives and, more importantly, our character. The ministries of the Holy Spirit are utterly amazing, and yet we have the ability within us to quench or stifle those ministries uh, the work of the Holy Spirit, which means to put us put out or at least dampen his power in our lives. We may even know Christians like that. We may be a Christian like that. Uh, we may have at one point or other quenched the, the movement of the Holy Spirit in our life. And we know that they are saved. Or we've known that our, we're saved, but our lives don't reflect it as, as much and as purely, as, as strongly as it should. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, And the New King James says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us, making us temples of God. The Holy Spirit is there to teach us and guide us and help us understand Scriptures. Again, as amazing as the ministries of the Holy Spirit are, we still have the ability to quench those. It really means saying no to God or no to something which the Spirit is, to which the Spirit is saying yes. What we should be saying is yes, Lord, because we know that He only has the best in mind for us. But if we're being honest, and there were times in my life when I felt a distinct prompting to either do something or to not do something, and I did not obey. It may have been something simple, a prodding to go talk to somebody. I often think of what might have been missed because of my not being obedient to doing what I was asked when I was asked by the Holy Spirit. In yielding to the Lord and His will, the Thessalonian Christians were told they should, one, not despise prophecies, two, further, that they were to test everything. To test means to examine, sift, weigh what is said. So what we are seeing is that Not everything they heard was necessarily prophesied, and as such, it was not necessarily from God. They needed to have that, what we would call today, simply discernment. The believers in Thessalonica had to distinguish between truth and error. We must do the same thing today as we listen to people preach and teach God's Word. We can't believe everything we hear without testing it and sifting it first. And in modern times, we live in a time where that it may never have been as important as it is now to pay attention to what you're being taught, what you're being told, and to sift it 
and to sift it through this. Does it hold up with the Word of God? Does it, does it contradict? If it contradicts the Word of God, it's incorrect. But does it match what God told us in His written Word? As Christians, we're in a way, we're consumers of information. We're consumers of Christian information for sure. But we're also consumers of other kinds of information. Just like we consume news and what other information we access in our culture. As consumers, we absolutely have to be discerning. There are hundreds of ministries that we have access to, especially now with YouTube and the internet, uh, podcasts. There are people... I mean, talking at you all the time. There are hundreds of these ministries we have access to. And it's just like how we consume the media, the mainstream media, which, frankly, we'd be better off turning off. There are ministries out there, and we need to be discerning of what we consume in this area, and frankly, some of those will need to be turned off. There are many who claim to be teachers and preachers and prophets and even apostles vying for our attention. And we need to weigh what they say. We need to see if the words out of their mouth match how they live. And perhaps more importantly, well, not perhaps, but absolutely importantly, does it line up with the Word of God? Does it line up with Scripture? We simply cannot believe everything we hear without testing it and examining it first. In exercising that, Uh, discernment we then need to be to hold to what is good and put away well what is bad one person (laughs) said to eschew what is bad i love that word but put away is a better way to put it we need to stay away from the things that are negative and not uh, validated by scripture In verse 22, Paul really sums up what he means to not quench the Spirit. He says, abstain from every kind of evil. Merriam-Webster tells us that to abstain means to choose not to do or have something, to refrain deliberately and often with an effort of self-denial from an action or a practice. Abstain from every kind of evil is essentially a broad statement that regardless of what is in our lives, that we may be uh, contrary to the will of God, whether counterfeit teaching of, uh, of living in a sinful way, something that we've all done, it should be taken out, removed, surgically excised from our lives. And then verse 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Let's say that again. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Scholars say that Paul here is thinking of a time when we will be perfect and blameless in the presence of God. God has set us apart for holy living. But don't make the mistake of believing that we can reach perfection now. I can tell you based on this last week that I have certainly not reached perfection. What it does mean, though, is that we should be holy, set apart in life and thinking to the Lord and his purposes. The word uh, whole in this passage refers to our spirit, soul, and body as a, as a group, that the, those three components making up the whole. To complete the total us, the total God-guided human being. That's what I hope we are. Each of these three parts should be preserved wholly to God and for God's use. What that really means is that there aren't any parts of us that belong to God and parts that belong to us. There's not parts in our life that are off-limits to God. We kind of tend to do that. I mean, I, we, I'm just being honest. We There's a some of us do that. We say, okay, all this is God's, but this little sin or this little idea or this little activity, God can't have this. And sometimes those can stack up. But you can't live a sanctified life if you don't let God sanctify the entire life. 
We in our totality belong to God. Everything we are belongs to him. Our physical bodies, our spiritual or intellectual life, and our psychological or natural life. So I just wanted to end this, um, this section. We'll go through the concluding exhortations in 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 through 28. Let's read those verses. So 1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 24 through 28. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. No one can sanctify himself or herself. No matter how hard we try to behave right and appear holy, we cannot do it on our own. Holiness cannot be attained unless God sets us apart as holy to himself. And then the great truth there is that he will be faithful to do it. God will bring it to pass. Verse 25 gives us a truly clear and simple exhortation. Brothers, pray for us. There is no exclamation point in the actual text, but I feel that it would be appropriate to put one there. We need prayer. It takes prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit to accomplish any work for God. I need prayer. We need, we'll see again in 2 Thessalonians 3.1, Paul asked these believers to pray for him and his companions. Prayer is, is vital. It's, it's a key thing. And it kind of makes sense that, that maybe that is how the adversary might want to attack us is in our prayer lives. In verse 26, he goes on with the greeting of, uh, to all believers. This greeting contains the phrase, a holy kiss. This is referred to four other times in the New Testament, the concept of a holy kiss. What this phrase signifies is a hug and a kiss on the cheek, men with men and women with women. This was a cultural expression of greeting and of their oneness or unity in God's family. The word holy underscores that it was not anything to do with romantic love or eros, but of distinctly Christian love towards fellow believers. It is a sign of the sanctified spiritual relationship. <clears throat> In verse 27, we, we see Paul write or dictate, <clears throat> I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. This is the fifth time in verses 12 through 27 that Paul uses the word brethren. Or we would simply translate that as brothers in our language today, which encompasses men and women alike. This reveals that the church is a family and should be viewed as such. Paul charged them to have the epistle read. Paul was conscious of the fact that this was God's word, even as he was writing, or more likely, dictating it. In closing, then Paul closed this letter with a benediction. A benediction is simply a prayer, uh, usually ending some kind of a proceeding. And the benediction is simply stating, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. As Paul wrote this to the Thessalonian church, his sincere hope was that God's grace and blessing would be on the people there. Paul wanted God's enablement, his favor, and his grace to be real in the lives of these people. In our next section, we'll head off into 2 Thessalonians, where Paul discusses persecution, the return of Jesus, and the need to remain hopeful and faithful and to avoid idleness, have no idleness among believers. We'll see a reminder that what we hope for influences the, what we live for. Just a reminder, if you haven't asked Jesus Christ into your heart, it's, a, it's an easy thing to do, and it will be the best decision that you ever make. It's, I, I tend to use the ABCs just to help remember it. The first is to admit or acknowledge that we're sinful and we need a Savior. Romans says, 3.10 says, there's none righteous, not, not one. B is to believe that Jesus is the Lord. John 14, 6 and 7 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And C is to confess our sins and confess this belief and call upon the name of the Lord. 
So that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a simple praying. It's like, Lord, forgive my sins. I've sinned against you. Please come into my heart, into my life, and make me clean. It's a simple request like that. And if you, <clears throat> if you make that, say that prayer, please contact us here, and, we, and uh, we can try to get resources to help you get started in your walk. Again, I just I pray, Lord, that everyone listening would uh, be blessed by the words of, of the Scripture that you've given us, Lord. I pray that as we move on in this book that, that you would continue to speak through your Spirit. And we ask for grace and peace to all those that are listening in your name. Amen.